This time, well, I'm going to get you now. This time. <laughs> I guess I didn't get you. No, you had it. You had it. Next basket gets free dinner. All right, you guys better make sure y'all get this on camera. Because I'm going to push him out. <laughs> <laughs> Time. They used to play in, you know, in Philly under the playgrounds yeah. basketball, but here they play something different. A game of volleyball is played much more aptly here in California. Which you're very involved with, right? Love it. You grew up in Philadelphia, right? That's right. That's right. And you played, you played a lot of sports, and you were good in a lot of sports too, man. Well, I think I was good in a lot of sports, right? You know, I uh, started off actually in track and field. Compared to your classmates, well, you three or four inches bigger, but in yeah. junior high school, I really just took off. When I got out of junior high school at ninth grade, I was about 6'11". In 1952, a long-legged schoolboy named Wilton Norman Chamberlain suits up for Overbrook High. The Big Dipper, as he is called, is an immediate sensation. Popping in 90 points in a single game and averaging 37 per outing, Wilt Chamberlain has college and pro scouts drooling. He must have had a fantastic offer from college. I mean, from all over the country. Everybody in the world must have recruited you. Well, you know, at, at that time, they said I probably was the most selective school boy, about 200 to 250 offers. And uh, as you know, I chose Kansas. In 1956, young Wilt Chamberlain makes his varsity debut as a sophomore. Averaging 30 points, 19 rebounds, and nine block shots per game, he leads Kansas to a 24-2 record and a berth in the NCAA Finals against top-ranked North Carolina. With the Tar Heels triple-teaming Chamberlain, the game goes into overtime. There's about three seconds to go, and we were one point down, and uh, one of our teammates was supposed to pass the ball to me on a high lob, give me a chance to pump the ball. He threw me a pass about... <laughs> With the three guys in front of me, went right, right into their hands, and I tell you... You lost your chance to win. That was it. <laughs> you left school your junior year, though. You didn't stay for your senior year. You left Kansas after your junior year. What, what made you make that decision? I had some offers which were kind of interesting time. Uh, there was a team out called the Harlem Clowns, which was composed right. of uh, some ex Globetrotter guys, uh, Goose Tatum and Marcus right. Haynes. Right. And uh, they uh, sent me a photostep copy of a check for $100,000. and were offering me $100,000 to play with them um, <laughs> for about six months. Now, 100 grand was unheard of money in those particular days. I mean, guys like yourself, y'all y'all make that all the time. <laughs> hey, hey, you know, $100,000, I would have jumped off the Empire State Building. <laughs> you end up really playing for the Harlem Globetrotters. That's right, they actually. $65,000 a year or something. $65,000 really... a year and bonuses if they said that the houses had X amount of people. Right. So there I was counting the houses all the time. With their huge new attraction, the Harlem Globetrotters draw 20% more fans in 1958. While the clown princes of basketball show off around the world, 22-year-old Will Chamberlain learns to handle the ball. In the midst of the Trotter Circus, Chamberlain plays the straight man, wowing millions and honing his skills for a budding pro career. I feel as though the Globe Trials actually uh, helped me a lot more than people can ever you know, ever really realized, even though they were sort of a team that was a clowning team, I didn't really clown. I, I, I played basketball. Well, in 1959, you moved to the NBA your rookie year, and you killed them, didn't you? 
Well, it was an interesting year time. It was interesting <laughs> because uh, I don't think most of the pros expected me to do exactly what I, what I did. Even against the world's best players, Will Chamberlain is simply unstoppable. The seven foot one inch dunk artist lifts his Philadelphia Warriors from last place to second. As a 23 year old rookie, Chamberlain is named the league's most valuable player. In his third season, 25 year old Will Chamberlain maintains an astonishing 50 point per game average. Then on March 2nd, 1962, against the New York Knicks, Chamberlain chases an unthinkable achievement. After three periods, the Dipper has 69 points, and the crowd is buzzing with excitement. Will Chamberlain has the shot at a 100-point game tonight. He's already broken his own record of 78 points in a game. He's scoring at will now. Dunk shot, good. Will has 98. Will needs one more hoop. He gets a pass, grabs it, and dunks it through. 100 points for Wilt Chamberlain. The most amazing one-man show in basketball history. I know it seems like a, a miracle number to a lot of the people, but I could have scored 100 a number of other, other times. But if I had a better day and had a better cause, I believe it would have been more important to me. But, you know, Tom, you take averaging 50 points a game. To me, that was phenomenal. Right. To go out on the court and say, hey, in order for me to hit my average, I have to score 50 tonight. And if I score anything under 50, then I'm really not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. One thing you did have trouble with, now I know, uh -huh. was free throws. But well, that's career. where I made my money. We're going to play more horses. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're going to see if okay. I can get some of that money from All right. You. OK. All right. I'm first up. First Ready? up. All right. Now I can do this. Watch. Oh, wait. Mui, keep, keep your feet right. Right. That's fine. Good. Good. Get, get the hair out of your eyes. Get the hair out of your eyes, bro. Oh, no! All right. I'd be All looking right. good here. That's not bad. All right, let's go. Underhand or overhand, and you got to stay behind the line. Behind the line? Just don't All be right. jumping up here. Left-handed. Well, that's more like me right there. See what I mean? <laughs> There were so many times that you got to, right to the end of the NBA playoffs and lost to the Boston Celtics. Well, it had to be very frustrating for you. Of course. I, I think it's a really uh, a tough position to be in when you can go all the way to, you know, like uh, the finals and losing the last, last minute, the last, last seconds and, and realize that, you know, a point or two was, was the difference. But for people who are watching, for people who are remembering, they only remember that you lost. From the start, Will Chamberlain's pro career is marred by near misses in playoff competition. Year after year, his teams come up short against the powerful Boston Celtics. In his first seven seasons, Chamberlain's teams lose five playoffs to Boston. Although he is the NBA's top scorer and rebounder, Chamberlain is branded a loser by the press and is widely blamed for his team's repeated failures. When you lose to the same team, like Boston, and they have a great center like Russell, uh, they tend sometimes to point fingers and say, hey, you know what, well, you lost because uh, he was better than you. Russell being, uh, you know, the center there of uh, the great Boston teams, and of course the media helped the player play it up and make it for what it was. Will Chamberlain versus Bill Russell. Through the 1960s, this duel stands out as the most intense personal rivalry in all of sport and contributes mightily to the growing interest in professional basketball. The seven foot one inch Chamberlain is a scoring machine. The six foot 10 inch Russell, a defensive genius. Chamberlain consistently out-rebounds Russell and outscores him almost two to one. But then, Russell has all of the championship rings. So the debate rages on. Who is basketball's best big man? Will Chamberlain or Bill Russell? Russell, as I said, uh, had a lot of pluses going for him, you know, uh, because he had one job to do and one job only. I had several that I had to do. I had right. to score at times, to rebound, to play de right. defense. And, uh, you know, I did it the best I, I could. I think that uh, most of my teams did the best they could. I think the Boston teams were just better. The coaching was just, was just, just better. So, therefore, they won the big ones. The team was better, but it does not necessarily mean that uh, one individual was better than the other. Oh, no. I don't, I don't think, as far as individual talent goes, that Russell uh, even come, comes close. 
Well, going to the 1966-67 season, you'd lost to the Celtics five times. But now, 1966-67, that season, you put t together a tremendous team. Well, actually, you know, it takes a time for a team to mesh. You know, I believe we had just meshed. With the addition of Alex Hannum as a, as a coach, I think we had arrived. But we had uh, just some tremendous talent. In 1966-67, it appears the Philadelphia 76ers have finally found the winning combination. Ladies and gentlemen, the Philadelphia 76ers with head coach Alex Hannum. The starting lineup at guards. Number 15, Hal Grant. Number 24, Wally Jones. The forwards. Number 25, Chet the Jet Walker. Number 54, Luke Jackson. And at center, number 13, Wilt Chamberlain. At age 30, Wilt Chamberlain is determined to rid himself of that uncomfortable loser's death. A stronger and more mature Chamberlain tries out the role of passer in his eighth NBA season and finds it much to his liking. With a well-balanced attack, the 76ers win 68 of 81 regular season games to set an NBA record. Still, the Sixers must beat the Boston Celtics in the playoffs or go home losers once more. Chamberlain backing in on Russell. Finger roll, no good. Battle for the rebound. Chamberlain gets it and lays it up and in. The tables have finally turned. The Sixers crush Boston in five games and earn the right to meet the San Francisco Warriors for the NBA crown. Sixth game of the NBA Finals. The 76ers trying to nail down the title. Sixers with the ball here in the fourth quarter. Cunningham, jumper no good. Thurman gets the rebound, and here come the Warriors. Cunningham steals it. Pass underneath to Chamberlain. Wilt's got 24. Sixers by one. The Warriors need to answer now. Thurman off the front rim, no good. Battle underneath. Wally Jones intercepts. Oh, what a ball game this is. Philadelphia in the driver's seat now. Jones to Luke Jackson. Jump shot. Good. The Sixers win 125-122. They're mobbing Chamberlain. And oh, is he ever happy. Luke has finally won the big one. After getting close so many times, well, to a uh, to championship, even in college and then the NBA, finally winning that world championship must have been a great feeling for you. Well, actually it was. You know, uh, probably it took months for it to really sink, sink mm -hmm. in time. But uh, once again, I must, you know, really illuminate on the fact that we had such a great basketball team. The year after the championship in Philadelphia, breakdown between the front office and the players and the coaches and everything, you get traded to the Los Angeles Lakers to what should be the all-time team ever. You got yourself, Jerry West, Elgin Baylor on the same team. Well, you know, it should have been uh, maybe by some people's opinion. I don't think so. Because it's right back to what we were talking before, Tom. Uh, both of those guys are shooters. Right. The Lakers had scarers. I mean, Jerry and Elgin carried the scoring and a little. Yourself, and yourself, too. You were a great right, scorer. And I, was, and I was a scorer then, you know. But unfortunately for us, and it proved to be valid now, Elgin was on his on his way out. He was on his last last legs. He'd given uh, the crowds uh, multitudes of uh, you know uh, sure. great great sure. games, and sure. he he was just about through. Jerry had some had some years years left. So really, it was just really Jerry and I as far as the superstar syndrome was was concerned. But when you got past Jerry and I, we didn't have anybody else. 1969, at the end of the season, the playoffs, the second game, another dramatic confrontation. Will Chamberlain, Bill Russell. This time, Chamberlain with the Lakers. Russell with a Celtics, seventh game. Here we go again. The eighth time Chamberlain and Russell have squared off in the playoffs. The Celts lead by 15 as we start the fourth quarter in the L.A. Forum. Chamberlain wins the tap. Baylor gets it to Freddie Crawford. Layup. Celtics now trying to hang on. Havlicek, jump shot, no good. Chamberlain gets the rebound, and he calls timeout. The big guy is in pain. And Laker coach Butch von Riedekopf is going to have to take Chamberlain out of the game. I came out in the fourth quarter with a knee problem, having it iced up, right. and then when it was iced up, I felt like I could go back in. I asked to go back in the game, and Butch just thought maybe the center who was playing uh, was doing a sufficient job. I think, though, Butch really wanted to see the Lakers win without him. 
The Celtics lead by three with just under a minute to play. They can ice it with a basket here. Siegfried trapped in the right corner. Now, Hundo Havlicek in trouble. Ball pops loose to Nelson. Jumper bounces in. What a basket. The Celtics could just run out the clock now. Boston will win its 11th title in 13 years. And we're wondering what happened to Wilt Chamberlain. In that seventh game, Wilt, of the playoffs against the Celtics, Bill Russell, after the game, which turned out to be his last game, his final game in the NBA, said that the only way you could come out of that game is with a broken leg. And defense did put a strain on the friendship that the two of you had, didn't it? I would say that we were we were very very close friends, uh, and uh, that's why the comment was really something that really kind of got got to me, and I looked for yeah. forward to hearing it come from him some way. I mean, you know, it's a lot of misquotes, you know, and uh, so I thought maybe it was something that someone had misquoted Russell as uh, saying. Later on, I found out it wasn't a mis misquote, and I felt as though that Russell should explain it to me, which he never has, and we've never talked since. The Lakers finally now a couple years later get a new coach, Bill Sharman, right? and they get a couple new players, and you guys really put it all together. Beginning on November 5th, 1971, the Lakers launch a phenomenal winning streak. Against the Atlanta Hawks, L.A. shoots for a record-setting 23rd straight win. The Lakers well in control here in the fourth quarter. Goodrich working Maravich on the baseline. Jump shot. Good. Atlanta ball now. Bellamy inside. Blocked by Chamberlain. Hairston, outlet pass to Goodrich. To West for an easy two. The Lakers have done it. Their 23rd win in a row. A new NBA record. For 10 more games, the Lakers continue their winning ways. Their 33-game winning streak is the longest in the history of professional sports. And Los Angeles is a clear favorite to take the 1972 NBA championship. The Lakers come out for the fifth game of the 1972 NBA Finals. They need just one more win over the Knicks to wrap up the title. Late in the fourth quarter, Jerry West dribbles right. Gets it back to McMillan. West shakes free against DeBusher and puts it up. Lakers lead by 14. Knicks with the ball. Bill Bradley running jumpers straight. But it's too late for the Knicks. Now Chamberlain in the lane. Gets his own rebound and dunks it. 24 points for Will. This one's in the bag. For the first time in the 12 years since they moved from Minneapolis, the Lakers are NBA champs. Final score, Lakers 114, Knicks 100. A five-game route for the Lakers. It's the first championship for Jerry West, the second for Wilt Chamberlain, and a fitting climax to a phenomenal season. Those guys, we really played really great together, and we had, had another year together, so we were the team to beat, and we just really played that way. But as great as that team was, and we won the championship that, that, that year, no way does that team compare with the 67, 68 team, I believe, you know? And I say 68. In Philadelphia. Right, in Philadelphia. I say 68, even though we lost it, we still were a much better team than any team I'd ever played on. One thing you gotta do for me, just for me, you gotta give me your all-time NBA team. My all-time NBA team. Guards. Well, you know, put a, the guards are easy. Oscar Robinson and Jerry, Jerry West. That's really very, very easy for me. But the fours really become a problem because you can have a lot of different choices right. in the fours, you know? But I think uh, if I had to really pick, pick two, I got I got to go two with uh, Rick Barry and Elgin Baylor. Who would your center be? You're sitting next to him, brother. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. You uh, might pick two. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Thank you. Will Chamberlain. Career scoring average, 30 points per game. NBA scoring champion, seven times. NBA rebounding champ, 11 times. Chamberlain never fouled out of a single game. Pro Basketball's all-time leading scorer and rebounder. Most valuable player, four times.
Chamberlain, the most dominant figure in basketball history.